This is the fourth video lecture on uh, David Hume's sentimentalist ethics is, uh, on his book, An Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals. So last time, of course, uh, we looked at sections um, five and six, where he argues against moral egoism that, uh, you know, we are not just wholly self-interested in our motivations uh, for ethical concerns. Uh, he tried to show that benevolence is something universal and rooted in our human nature, why utility uh, pleases us, and of course we saw uh, the catalog of qualities uh, that are useful uh, to ourselves. Now turning to section 7, Hume then begins looking at qualities immediately agreeable now to ourselves. So as opposed to use, now we are looking at those things which uh, excite us, which we uh, assent to, which we um, uh, agree with, right? We find uh, pleasurable, right? We like those uh, kinds of qualities. So Hume begins mentioning what he says is that quality of cheerfulness, which even if uh, someone is in a melancholy situation, uh, you know, where you feel isolated, uh, not that well, that the capacity to be cheerful or to find uh, cheerfulness in other things or even in oneself in some manner, um, that is a quality which is immediately agreeable to ourselves and that it um, actually makes us morally better people to possess uh, that quality. Now because of this, he says, it can be inferred, and remember, uh, his ethics is uh, inferentially based. Uh, that is it to say it is an ethics which is based in looking at the empirical world to see, uh, to extrapolate from all the particular uh, cases in which we uh, assent to things, we find these agreeable. What then uh, are ethics found on? Then he says from this, then it can be inferred that there exists this third mental quality, those that are agreeable to ourselves. And it's important to understand what he means by that is it gives uh, immediate pleasure to those who observe the trait. So that could be, uh, again, that you possess it in yourself and experience it and take pleasure in, in you know, when you, uh, you know, you can make yourself cheerful, for example. Uh, or again, that you observe that trait in others and it gives you pleasure because you have that capacity to recognize that. Now, uh, interestingly, he also says that these qualities can be privately or publicly useful. That it's not like uh, before we were looking at qualities that are only useful, and now we're looking at those which are only agreeable. But instead, uh, they can be both. The difference is that uh, the main value which we ascribe to these qualities, in this case, is, as he says, the immediate pleasure which they communicate to the, the person possessed of them. Uh, specifically, uh, we'll see two examples of this actually, why even though some of these qualities are um, useful, they're not, we wouldn't say, you know, put them entirely in the useful category, but instead say uh, primarily they are agreeable, though they have a use. So some of these qualities agreeable to the self, uh, are those such as, as I mentioned, cheerfulness, there's merriness, magnanimity or a greatness of mind, dignity, courage, tranquility, benevolence, and delicacy of taste. Now, benevolence, uh, we already mentioned, of course, is uh, useful to others, uh, but it is also agreeable to self as well. And I will actually read um, a few of these. So, for example, uh, with uh, dignity of character, or this greatness of mind, magnanimity, he writes, Who is not struck with any signal instance of greatness of mind, or dignity of character, with elevation of sentiment, disdain of slavery, and with that noble pride and spirit, which arises from conscious virtue? The sublime, says Longinus, is often nothing but the echo or image of magnanimity. And where this quality appears in anyone, even though a syllable be not uttered, it excites our applause and admiration, 
as may be observed of the famous silence of uh, Ix in the Odyssey, which expresses more noble disdain and resolute indignation than any language can convey. Uh, but then, if we turn and we can look at uh, another example here, actually, uh, make sure. How, yes, uh, 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 courage. This virtue of courage. Uh, this is where he explains why, though courage is also useful, we can say in this case, it is primarily agreeable to the self. So he says, the utility of courage, both to the public and, and this is, uh, I should say, sorry, section uh, 7, of course, paragraph 11. He says, the utility of courage, both to the public and to the person possessed of it, is an obvious foundation of merit. But to anyone who duly considers of the matter, it will appear that this quality has a, pecu a pe peculiar uh, luster, which it derives wholly from itself, and from that noble elevation inseparable from it. Its figure, drawn by painters and poets, displays in each feature a sublimity and daring confidence, which catches the eye, engages the affections, and diffuses by sympathy a like sublimity of sentiment over every spectator. So that this uh, quality is something which, um, when it is possessed or um, uh, when it is recognized, it uh, brings joy to ourselves. In some way, uh, we feel, you know, uh, maybe safe about this uh, kind of courage in a certain situation. Uh, or it makes ourselves feel confident, right, that it brings this about which we like, you know, it could bring some, you know, stability maybe to ourselves, as opposed to fear, of course. Uh, we have tranquility. He says, of the same class of virtues with courage is that undisturbed philosophical tranquility, superior to pain, sorrow, anxiety, and each assault of adverse fortune. Conscious of his own virtue, says the philosophers, the sage elevates himself above every accident of life, and securely placed in the temple of wisdom, looks down on inferior mortals, engaged in pursuit of honors, riches, reputation, and every frivolous enjoyment. So, of course, we mentioned uh, earlier um, with the Stoic sage, this tranquility of the mind where you were not moved by things out of your control, you were unsurprised uh, by what may happen um, in the world to others or to yourself. Uh, there was also actually in uh, the skeptic tradition in Pyrrhonism, um, where uh, tranquility is actually uh, desired, or at least it is uh, praised in one who is not dogmatic and that they are not uh, entrenched in their positions in, in philosophical disputes, you know, where like one might believe something, but instead the um, Pyrrhonist would praise that person who does not just dogmatically say, no, 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 I believe this, so I'm going to defend it no matter what, but instead weighs you know, what are the opposing arguments to this thing, and maybe suspends judgment and achieves ataraxia or uh, tranquility, this state of mind. And then I wanted to look at benevolence as well, because this is another example of where, although it, it's useful, uh, it is not solely that. So Hume writes of this, The merit of benevolence, arising from its utility and its tendency to promote the good of mankind, has already been explained, and is no doubt the source of a considerable part of that esteem which is so universally paid to it. But it will also be allowed that the very softness and tenderness of the sentiment, its engaging endearments, its fond expressions, its delicate attentions, and all that flow of mutual confidence and regard which enters into a warm attachment of love and friendship, it will be allowed, I say, that these feelings, being delightful in themselves, are necessarily communicated to the spectators and melt them into the same fondness and delicacy. That while, of course, benevolence uh, can be useful to others, uh, especially if you're in your, a situation and someone uh, helps you out of that, out of just, you know, just solely for the, uh, you know, based on a, it being a benevolent act. Uh, but we also take pleasure in uh, benevolence itself. Uh, and in some cases, you know, we, uh, in, in doing, uh, in helping others, right, we can feel a sense of joy or in some way feel uh, good about ourselves for doing that. So that is a, an effect 
uh, of benevolence. Okay. So then moving to section uh, 8, we have then, if we had in the first case, qualities uh, useful to others, then we have qualities um, useful to ourselves, and then there are qualities immediately agreeable to ourselves. In section 8, we see that there are qualities immediately agreeable to others. So those uh, uh, who uh, possess them, uh, they take, or sorry, if you possess that, others enjoy that you possess that trait. So, for example, uh, as justice exists to mediate the oppositions of interest in humankind, right, that we have our self interests uh, to some extent, you know, we do have an ego, um, and that justice, therefore, is uh, that convention, uh, that institution which serves to ensure that we kind of don't, you know, just, uh, when we, we get annoyed with someone else, right, we don't just go and, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I guess, you know, in some cases, right, like in the state of nature, we don't just go and kill the other person uh, because, you know, they, they are seen as maybe a threat to ourselves or something like that. Well, Hume says similarly that good manners and politeness also have been introduced as rules which produce agreeableness in others. That good manners and politeness, uh, qualities immediately agreeable to others, exist because they serve that same function of, uh, as, that justice does to be that mediation between human beings. Um, so somewhat I'm reminded of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's play No Exit, where he famously says, hell is other people. Maybe if you're, uh, you know, uh, quarantined or isolated with some other people and you have to spend a lot of time with them, you might agree, hell is other people, right? Um, but Hume is saying that uh, that's why good manners and politeness exist, to try and to mitigate that um, uh, experience. Um, so it's not then that these qualities like politeness uh, and good manners are praised because it's agreeable, again, to those that possess them, but it's because they're agreeable to those who experience those qualities. Hume says, among well-bred people, a mutual deference is affected, contempt of others disguised, authority concealed, attentions given to each in his turn, and an easy stream of conversation maintained without vehemence, without interruption, without eagerness for victory, and without any airs of superiority. These attentions and regards are immediately agreeable to others, abstracted from any consideration of utility, so the use they might have, or beneficial tendencies. They conciliate affection, promote esteem, and extremely enhance the merit of the person who regulates his behavior by them. Uh, so, of this list of some of these qualities that are agreeable to others, there are, as mentioned, uh, you know, good manners, politeness, but there's also wit, uh, eloquence and good conversational abilities, modesty, decency, cleanliness, and what Hume calls that special overall manner. Um, that one, I'm actually, uh, I, I think he's the most ambiguous about that quality, um, but I think it has to do with someone when we find some kind of um, romantic interest in them, some quality uh, about them, uh, whereas their overall manner, the way that they display themselves, is, is my understanding uh, of what Hume means by that. Um, but I did want to mention, um, you know, cleanliness, right? Take the case of where probably it's enjoyable when you go over to someone's house, it's not a complete mess and there's not like food left out for days, you know, that stink or something like that, right? Um, we're probably less likely to you know, go over to that person's house and hang out with them a lot uh, because we might not find that, you know, the dirty situation of the, where they live, all that, you know, likable. Um, but consider as well the way in which we can be moved by a person who possesses really good conversational abilities, right? Good rhetorical skills, someone who can tell a story, which we, you know, maybe flock to that person. We like to spend time with them simply because of that, uh, trait that they possess. Uh, so these are all things then 
that you, of course, would want to possess uh, in part of being a, a good, well-rounded person. So we actually see that if we take all of um, the different list of virtues and so on, and we put this entire catalog together, right? So we have those qualities useful to others, uh, mainly stemming from benevolence, but we can break that up into sociability, mercy, gratitude, there's friendliness, generosity, natural affection, public spirit, and sympathy with others. Then there's qualities useful, again, to the self. So again, uh, you know, benevolence, again, is useful because, uh, you know, um, just the way in which we can help each other in a society and make society flourish, be a, a, a more happier place, you know, things like charity and so on, right? These are examples of where uh, it is useful for benevolence to flourish for others, so for the public as a whole. Uh, but then, of course, there are those qualities that are useful to the self. So discretion can be useful, especially industry, right? You, you, you work hard. Uh, frugality, strength of mind or self-control. Uh, intellectual capacity, right? So your intelligence, foresight, common sense, your memory. But also sobriety, patience, and perseverance. All these things can be useful for yourself in accomplishing uh, goals. And oftentimes, of course, we um, praise people that display these uh, traits because of what they're able to accomplish due to them. Uh, then again, as we mentioned, uh, qualities agreeable to the self of cheerfulness, being merry, greatness of mind, magnanimity, dignity, uh, pride, courage, tranquility, benevolence, delicacy of taste. Uh, that if we have the capacity uh, to uh, find these things agreeable, usually uh, we're a more well-rounded person. Also, people like us, which moves us to uh, qualities agreeable to others, so that is good for the public when people have these, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, good manners, wit, eloquence, good conversational abilities, modesty, including intellectual modesty, right? No one likes it. Um, they're always, you know, trying to say, oh, I, I'm, listen to me, I'm the smart one, or, you know, trying to put someone down uh, for not knowing that much, for being ignorant. Um, so for Hume, then, uh, to be a good person is to develop all of these different uh, traits that you cannot simply have those that are only useful or agreeable to yourself, of course. Uh, you're not a good person just with that. You need those, of course, as well that are agreeable and useful to others and then uh, vice versa. So to be a good person for Hume, you develop uh, all these different uh, qualities, these what would uh, in turn be virtues. So, of course, uh, as I've been mentioning throughout, and especially on, on the first lecture, uh, Hume's ethics is called uh, sentimental ethics. He's a sentimentalist, meaning his ethics are based around our feeling, right? And so, of course, that uh, flies in the face of some of the other people uh, we've already studied. And uh, the next lecture with Kant, you know, Kant is entirely going to disagree with any kind of ethics based on feeling or sentiment. Um, uh, but again, a, a key argument for Hume is that human sentiment, because ethics can be founded on human sentiment, it is because sentiment is universal and part of human nature. So he thinks all those qualities we listed in that catalog, all of these are things that we naturally possess the ability to appreciate or the ability to understand these are good things, right? Think back to when we talked about language and the way in which he tried to argue that there's just uh, this dualism that is natural in our language for all human beings of um, referring to some things as good or bad or better or worse, right? Of assigning value to things. So he says of this, when a man denounces another, his enemy, his rival, he is understood to speak the language of self-love and to express sentiments, right, uh, arising from his particular circumstances. That there are, of course, cases where uh, we might be hostile to someone else, uh, which does, of course, uh, arise from uh, our ego, the self-love that we have, that self-interest. But, again, it is not self-interest that uh, is the foundation of our ethics, or our human nature for Hume. Yeah, so continuing, he says, 
As opposed to that case where we can denounce the other as a rival or enemy based on our particular circumstances, he says, but when he bestows on any man the epithets of vicious or odious or depraved, so when we refer to someone as that, he then speaks another language and expresses sentiments in which he expects all his audience are to concur with him. Right, that when we refer to someone as being vicious or maybe evil, uh, there's something that's not just uh, particular to our situation, but it's something universal. And that, for Hume, is uh, the, the, the key point about considering an ethics. So he says, he must therefore depart from his private and particular situation and must choose a point of view common to him with others. That we must think back to uh, the first lecture uh, when we talked about uh, sympathy and the ability to, you know, to empathize, to put yourself in someone else's shoes when we mentioned Adam Smith and talking about uh, why for human benevolence is that universal thing uh, common to all uh, human beings. That because of that, because of the fact that we must uh, choose this point of view, as he says, common to others, Hume says, he must move some universal principle of the human frame and touch a stream to which all mankind have an accord and, sym and, and uh, symphony. And that is the fact that we all have these base, fundamental, universal sentiments in our human nature, and specifically uh, benevolence for a human. Now, that morality then is found on sentiment is something very different from uh, what we've discussed before with uh, the Stoics. So actually, against the Stoics, Hume writes, to sustain and abstain, that is, to be patient and continent, appeared to some of the ancients a summary comprehension of morals. Epictetus has scarcely ever mentioned the sentiment of humanity and compassion, but in order to put his disciples on their guard against it. The virtue of the Stoics seems to consist chiefly in a firm temper and a sound understanding, right? So he's um, distinguishing his understanding of virtue from and ethics generally from what we discussed with Stoicism, where if you remember, uh, there's that one case from Epictetus in the handbook where, you know, Epictetus says, yes, you want to, um, you know, grieve with someone who is grieving, but make sure that you yourself are not really grieving, that you are not really moved by it, but that help, the, you know, you even said help the other person by displaying um, that sympathy. Uh, Hume would think there's something it, unhuman about that, about uh, having that as some ideal that, again, if, if you remember, uh, for him that, you know, that would just be something imaginative and really we are moved by feeling. And when we really grieve and we really actually are a good person, it is because we truly are identifying with them and are moved by them, not simply in the way that Epictetus talked about. Um, there is actually in uh, the four, uh, Appendix 4, uh, there is something that Hume wants to tackle regarding his understanding of ethics and virtue. Because a lot of his, or the qualities, right, he calls them qualities, really they could be called virtues, but he's very careful about that word virtue. And as he mentions in the fourth appendix, um, it's because there's a common distinction understood between what is sometimes referred to as personal merit as opposed to virtue. And to show this distinction, he lists that there are for example, quality, as he says, qualities of the heart, the ways in which we're moved by things. For these, their immediate exertion is accompanied by sentiment or feeling. So, for, you know, for example, uh, courage, pride, cheerfulness, tranquility, modesty, cleanliness, affability, that these are things that, and of course, think of, you know, especially courage, pride, um, cheerfulness, tranquility, mo uh, modesty, those are things, right, listed by um, uh, Aristotle, for example. And he thinks those are generally understood to be uh, what is called virtues. But that instead, what he calls qualities of the head here, 
These things are exerted without any immediate sentiment in the person possessed of them and are no only known by their effects. So we only have the feeling after the fact. As where courage um, originates from feeling, instead, uh, the liking or the understanding that, uh, for example, industry or frugality is good is only after the fact, after we see the consequence of the thing. And so often he thinks, well, then people will want to say, well, that's really not virtue. Things like industry, frugality, temperance, uh, secrecy, perseverance. Hume says a lot of people think that those really aren't virtues, but they're what you would call personal merit. And so maybe, uh, you know, Hume is too broad in his list of virtues. Hume disagrees. And uh, one of the main reasons that he disagrees is that it's difficult to demarcate the concept of virtue, right? To uh, entirely define the limits of virtue where those things called personal, you know, where virtue ends and then personal merit begins. He says of this, should we lay hold of the distinction between intellectual and moral, or you know, the qualities of the heart and the intellect, uh, those uh, endowments, and affirm the last alone to be the real and genuine virtues, so those moral virtues, because they alone lead to action, we should find that many of those qualities, usually called intellectual virtues, such as prudence, penetration, discernment, discretion, had also a considerable influence on conduct. And if they have a considerable influence on conduct, well, that means they influence the way in which ultimately we relate to others. And again, that is the key uh, concern for an ethics, is the way in which we relate to others. And because of that, Hume says uh, personal merit does indeed suffice as virtue. So what is virtue exactly? For Hume, virtue is a fusion of two things. So you, you know you can't just have one of these and say that oh vir you know someone possesses this virtue. You need one to have a mental quality in the person that's being considered. So you need to have that quality of, uh, we'll say, compassion, for example. But you also need that to be recognized by others. So you have to have a perception by those who consider then that person, the, 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 the quality in that person of compassion. It's not enough if other people just conceive that you have that compassion, but you really don't possess it. And it's not enough that you really possess that uh, you know, quality of compassion but that it never actually shows. In each of those cases, you wouldn't really, for Hume, uh, be understood to have that virtue of compassion. And therefore, you know, if we take all of those virtues, if that were the case with all of them, you would be a virtuous person. It's only when both of those are combined that virtue is had. And then one can be considered a virtuous person. So, now that we've uh, discussed the entirety, um, minus the discussion at the end, or sorry, the dialogue at the end uh, after the appendix uh, of Hume's uh, ethics, why be moral at all? Right? Why would we consider Hume's text at all and say, well, you know, maybe there's some merit to this thing. Uh, maybe there's a reason why. I should be benevolent to others, right? Why not still say, well, you know, even if uh, benevolence is the foundation, you know, of our morality or, or that, you know, we all, it's universal in all of us, maybe I'll still be selfish and I'll try to take advantage of, of other people because maybe for some reason, um, as, as Hume refers to this person, uh, why not be the sensible knave, as he calls them, and simultaneously lie to others since, you know, being trustworthy and truthful uh, is a virtue, why not just simultaneously, you know, acknowledge and promote, yeah, the, you know, this ethics, okay, it's universal, it's, it's, you know, human nature. Why not simultaneously lie to gain an advantage while, again, promoting that benevolent system of ethics? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure we could think of cases where, um, 
again, you know, besides the law in part, but I mean, cases where we could actually maybe withhold our benevolence because maybe someone is in a bind and we see them as a competitor. And, we, and although we publicly promote benevolence, when we actually have, have the opportunity, why not, uh, if, you know, we think no one else sees, why not withhold that benevolence for the sake of our own gain? Because of these considerations, Hume says himself, what, or he asks the question, what theory of morals can ever serve any useful purpose unless it can show by particular detail that all the duties which it recommends are also the true interest of each individual? What's the point of writing this entire book of ethics if Hume cannot show that actually it is in the interest of every single human being to try and develop in themselves those virtues which uh, he has formulated. So Hume does give them uh, a response, of course. He wants to try to answer this and prove his text is worthwhile. And uh, so I want to actually read his response here about, you know, why not just be that sensible knave who publicly, again, you know, acknowledges, promotes morality, but secretly uh, is selfish, right, to try to get ahead. So this is, actually I'm going to read uh, at the end of the conclusion, section 9 here. So this would be pages 155 to 156, or paragraphs 23 to uh, 25 here. Uh, so his, his answer, his response to this, uh, begins where he says, I must confess that if a man think that this reasoning of, you know, the reasoning of the sensible knave, uh, much requires an answer, it will be a little difficult to find any which will to him appear satisfactory and convincing. If his heart rebel not against each, or sorry, not against such pernicious maxims, if he feel no reluctance to the thoughts of villainy or baseness, he has indeed lost a considerable motive to virtue. And we may expect that his practice will be answerable to his speculation. But in all ingenious natures, the antipathy to treachery and roguery is too strong to be counterbalanced by any views of profit or pecuniary advantage. Inward peace of mind, consciousness of integrity, a satisfactory re review of our own conduct. These are circumstances very requisite to happiness and will be cherished and cultivate, cultivated by every honest man who feels the importance of them. Such a one has, besides, the frequent satisfaction of seeing knaves with all their pretending, with all their pretended cunning and abilities, betrayed by their own maxims, and while they purpose to cheat with moderation and secrecy, a tempting incident occurs. Nature is frail, and they give into the snare, whence they can never extricate themselves without a total loss of reputation, and the forfeiture of all future trust and confidence with mankind. But were they ever so secret and successful, the honest man, if he has any tincture of philosophy, or even common observation and reflection, will discover that they themselves are, in the end, the greatest dupes, and have sacrificed the invaluable enjoyment of a character with themselves, at least, for the acquisition of worthless toys and gewgaws. How little is requisite to supply the necessities of nature? And in a view to pleasure, what comparison between the unbought satisfaction of conversation, society, study, even health, and the common beauties of nature, but above all, the peaceful reflection on one's own conduct? What comparison, I say, between these and the feverish, empty amusements of luxury and expense. These natural pleasures, indeed, are really without price, both because they are below all price in their attainment and above it in their enjoyment. So his response is that, sure, there's probably some circumstances, situations where this person uh, really would by, you know, trying to game the system, break the rules, they would probably have some advantages, and they would enjoy things that those who try to abide by the rules wouldn't. 
But to do that, Hume says, you actually sacrifice a lot. So you sacrifice peace of mind and instead you have to suffer anxiety because, you know, at any point in time you could be caught. Your um, reputation could be tarnished. You might suffer punishment. Uh, and it's, of course, really likely that you'll eventually get caught anyway, at least statistically, right? He does acknowledge that he thinks, of course, philosophy, the arguments like this, if someone hears that, that doesn't mean they're going to now realize, oh, you know, it is in my best interest to be moral. He recognizes, you know, some people still anyways are going to uh, want to be immoral and think they can, you know, uh, get ahead of everyone else. Uh, but he still thinks, uh, even if his argument doesn't convince them, he's still correct that they will ultimately suffer, that they won't enjoy those greatest things which only come about um, through uh, being moral, especially um, through following and trying to develop those virtues which uh, Hume argues are uh, necessary uh, to, to being a good person. So, you know, what is the, the consequence of Hume's ethics here? What has, uh, you know, been the end result? What's, what's been his uh, influence, his legacy? Well, on the one hand, he's been really influential in, in his ethics. Uh, so when we turn to utilitarianism, people like Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and so on, uh, utilitarianism was influenced by Hume because of his focus on uh, pleasure, his focus on utility. And although utilitarianism is uh, different from Hume's ethics, um, it's still very much influential. And Hume is influential for many different people even those that disagree with him, of course, that we'll see, like in Kant. Um, but even if someone like uh, William James and his pragmatism, James was influenced by uh, David Hume as well. One thing, though, that develops a bit later is more of a focus on a rule-based ethics or an ethics where you can kind of, you know, or maybe a quantitative-based ethics where you can kind of put into a system like, here's the data, what should I do? And then it spits out the answer of like, well, this is the moral thing you should do. Hume doesn't really offer that, right? In certain situations, he can give you, kind of, similar to Aristotle, right? He can say, well, this is kind of what you should maybe aim for, but, you know, there is no like specific formula which you can plug in and then determine, well, this is, was exactly the right thing to do. And it holds, you know, it's, it's consistent. And in fact, that uh, criticism that he doesn't have that, we'll see with these next two lectures, especially in Kant, you know, Kant strives for consistency. And Hume's ethics don't provide you with consistency because uh, it, it might be in the case that, you know, one of these qualities are good in one situation, but in another situation, maybe you need to tone it down a bit, you know? And if that's the case for, for Kant, well, in no way can you ever develop a theory of uh, morality, a theory of the good, with something that can be um, maybe in some cases contradictory. And if it can be contradictory, well then, uh, it can't be true. Um, and, and the same thing with utilitarianism as well. We'll see where uh, there's the principle of utility that you kind of are able to weigh out like a scale. You know, you compare situations, what are the outcomes here? And so you'll know based on utilitarianism, if you accept their premises, what is the right action to proceed with? And Hume doesn't really offer you that. So in that way, maybe uh, his ethics are, are lacking. But I personally do think his ethics offer something very, uh, very human. In fact, uh, I'm reminded reading his ethics of uh, at the beginning of his book on epistemology and metaphysics, uh, an inquiry concerning human understanding. Um, he says, and actually I want to get this uh, quote right now uh, as I was about to uh, mention it. There's, there's something human about Hume's ethics that I think um, is really admirable. Okay, uh, after some digging, uh, I, I found the quote. Um, and I actually, I actually want to read uh, some of this paragraph at the beginning of uh, his book, An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, because... I think 
the reason you'd have to understand why his ethics, as I was mentioning, you know, can get criticized by people like Kant and so on for not being, you know, something consistent. Um, you know, it's not a rule-based ethics or anything like that. And I, I do think you have to understand his uh, epistemology and his criticisms of metaphysics uh, because Hume thought that, uh, well, I'll, I'll actually begin uh, reading here. So he, he writes, man is a reasonable being and as such receives from science his proper food and nourishment. But so narrow are the bounds of human understanding that little satisfaction can be hoped for in this particular, either from the extent or security of his acquisitions. Man is a sociable being, no less than a reasonable being. But neither can he always enjoy company agreeable and amusing, or preserve the proper relish for them. Man is also an active being, and from that disposition, as well as from the various necessities of human life, must submit to business and occupation. But the mind requires some relaxation, and cannot always support its bent to care and industry. So right, there are cases where you can't always, as we'll see maybe with Kant and utilitarianism a bit later, he was arguing you can't, you know, we're not just these you know, robots that are always going to be able to, to compute, you know, like, oh, what's the correct logical situation? How do I apply myself here and now there, right? There is something where we have to um, habituate ourselves and create a habit of being compassionate uh, and so on, which can only mean then uh, that, especially for then uh, ethics, uh, and this is again what I admire about uh, Hume's kind of humanity, it has to be rooted to some extent uh, for Hume uh, in feeling or sentiment. Um, and this stems a lot from, again, his epistemology where uh, being an empiricist, uh, he famously, with the problem of induction, argues that you, when you make arguments from experience, well, they're actually all a reliance on past experiences. So when you make predictions about the future that like, you know, when I drink this water right here, it's going to nourish me and not poison me. Hume writes, you know, the only way I can know for sure that it's not going to do that is by a reliance on the past. Where I can say, well, in the past, every time I've drinking this water, you know, it's never um, hurt me. So I infer that it, it's the same. There's some constancy, a uniformity in nature. Uh, but of course... Uh, that is just circular because it begs the question, well, how do I know this time? And again, all I can do is point to the past. So because of that, and because is, um, ethics are based in human sentiment, they are empirical, and therefore uh, they can't be certain. Just like our experience, you know, my thought that, you know, well, uh, the moon is out, so therefore the sun will rise in the morning, right? Um, that's not guaranteed. Uh, even though it might be extremely super likely and highly probable, so much so that you should assume it will uh, rise in the morning. Uh, but continuing with this this um, bit here, he's, he writes, um, It seems then that nature has pointed out a mixed kind of life as most suitable to human race, and secretly admonished them to allow none of these biases to draw too much, so as to incapacitate them for other occupations and entertainments, right? And remember, because Hume uh, argued that, you know, reason plays some role, of course, and especially in some of these cases where these qualities we only experience after the fact, right? It's reason that allows us to say, like, well, you know, justice is something conventional. But still, ethics proceeds from sentiment first, in the ways in which we are moved, we are uh, inclined to, you know, find things agreeable, uh, or to act in certain ways, like being benevolent. So he writes, Indulge your passion for science, says she, but let your science be human, and such as may have a direct reference to action and society. Abstruse thought, as we'll see maybe in the case of Kant uh, for Hume, abstruse thought and profound researches I prohibit, and will severely punish by the pensive melancholy which they introduce, by the endless uncertainty in which they involve you, and by the cold reception which your pretended discoveries will meet with when communicated. And so here's the quote that I am reminded of 
um, closing out uh, Hume's uh, ethics. So Hume famously writes, be a philosopher, but amidst all your philosophy, be still a man. So next time uh, we'll discuss Kant's deontological ethics.